Hello everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Storytime with Mr. Jackson. Now last year I'd made a promise to myself that I would launch my own YouTube channel. Finally, I was going to do more with my useless knowledge than inflict stories on the people around me. But little did I know the work involved. The long hours of research and writing and the constant editing. So much editing. Now, as you might imagine, I made tons of mistakes, building narratives and stitching together videos only for everything to fall well short of my intended goals. But regardless of whether or not my early work turned out like a C-grade high school project or not, I kept at it, continuing to press forward no matter how ignorant or ill-equipped I found myself, which was kind of exhilarating in its own way, to be honest with you. Now, believe it or not, I was originally going to release a series on William Barents, of all things, but something was holding me back. Is it boredom? Laziness? Fear? No, it was, wasn't any of those things. It was, it was actually a story of all things. A true story. A story of a man who followed his dreams, pushing on farther than he ever could have imagined on a shoestring. And no matter how hard I tried, it just kept popping into my mind over and over again, rattling around like the proverbial bean in the empty tin can. And it was then that I realized that you can't force these things. Sometimes you just have to drop everything and get it out there. But enough of the narcissistic rambling. We've gotten all the mushy stuff out of the way. So please allow me to welcome you to the very first episode of Storytime with Mr. Jackson. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. And I'm proud as can be to present you the story of Donald Crowhurst, the penniless electrician who tried to sail around the world. <laughs> Have you ever wanted anything so bad that you'd literally do anything to get it? What if your best wasn't good enough? What if everything between heaven and earth conspired against you? Would you give up? Be realistic and chalk it up to chance. Or would you, like the rugged sailors of old, simply change the game? Would you lie? How far would you go in order to spit in the eye of fate herself? Well, all these questions and more were barreling through the mind of one Donald Crowhurst as he sat there floating all alone in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But this was no pleasure cruise, far from it. In fact, it was nearly over for him, and only a few weeks after it had only begun. It was to be a race, he thought, one he was supposed to be winning right now. But as Donald took stock of his situation, he could see the end was near. He knew that all he had worked for was about to go to pieces. And he could literally feel it. His boat was falling apart, just like everything else in his life. As he inspected his small craft, he sat there and sighed. Her generator was a smoking and sputtering ruin, her rigging nothing more than a tattered rat's nest, and now her hull was leaking in several places. All at once it dawned on him. He was a failure, a loser even. A man who fell just as others were hitting their stride. He would be a laughing stock when he got home. A joke. His name a byword for big talk with no results. No one would ever take him seriously again. How could he face them? Fuck me, laugh. <laughs> well, Donald had begun to spiral, his mind racing faster and faster, desperate to make sense of his situation. Desperate for any way out. And then... All of a sudden, he knew the way out of this mess, knew how he was going to fix everything. He could still be a hero. He was still the master of his fate. <music> Donald Crowhurst was born in 1932 in British-occupied India and was by all accounts an affable child, getting good marks in school, though he did become something of a daredevil in his teenage years. Well, his mother, on the other hand, seems to have been disappointed in him from day one, dressing Donald up in dresses and pretty hats until he was eight years old because she wanted a girl. Well, when Donald was 16, his father passed, and soon the family began to struggle financially. Young Donald had wished to go on to university, wished to become a respected engineer and working on the latest and greatest technological equipment. But with his father's death, he was forced to drop out of primary school 
and enter an electrical engineering apprenticeship in order to put food on the table. Any independent hopes he once had for the future now replaced by the path that fate had placed before him. In 1953, he enlisted in the Royal Air Force, where by all accounts he turned into something of a party animal, drinking and staying out late. And unfortunately for him, Donald was soon asked to resign within a few months. But he wasn't discharged. Instead, he was told that the Royal Engineers would be a better fit for him. This no doubt lent him a rather bad attitude, and was discharged from the Royal Engineers only a few years later in 1956 for stealing a car off base and joyriding it around like a frat boy on vacation. He did the stare and drive on you, didn't he? He got that from me. Don't be scared, Well, now a civilian, he got married to a lovely woman named Claire and started a family. But still, he was unfulfilled. Well, Donald soon got into his head that he was to be an inventor, the Thomas Edison of his hometown of Tinsmith. And he was decently skilled at it, eventually designing a radio beacon from scratch for use at sea, a device he was quite proud of. He was proud enough to where he was soon all in, opening a small electric shop he called Electron Utilization to market and sell his new gadgets. But unfortunately, nothing ever came easy to Donald. And despite his enthusiasm, he found little success marketing the gadget. He was no doubt an intelligent and likable man, able to talk most people into doing just about whatever he asked. But, likable or not, Donald had little understanding of business or even general finance for that matter. The man's business career can charitably be described as an utter disaster. It's a wonder the man ever had two pennies to rub together. But business wasn't his style anyway, just a means to an end. No, Donald was a dreamer. He was an idea man, and thus was always thinking five steps ahead of where he was, simply hoping steps one through four would just kind of figure themselves out. I don't get it. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. Oh, I get it. And for five years, Donald continued to fail toward the middle, never breaking out of the safe mold that fate had placed him in despite his hardest efforts. As Donald entered his thirties, a depression seemed to wash over him. He began to blame himself and the entire world at large. Someone had to be to blame for all this. I mean, why was he still here peddling transistors out of a hole in the wall? Well, one day, while Donald and a friend were off the coast fishing, his radio sprang to life. With glee and wonder in his voice, the anchor announced how the famed seaman Francis Chichester had just returned from a solo voyage around the world. Well, the BBC gushed with pride as they described how the 61-year-old had sailed all the way around the world in a mere 226 days, stopping only once to resupply and refit. It was a new world record, both in terms of time and the age of the man who accomplished it. Is it not good? It is miraculous. Both men listened to the broadcast silently, each hanging on every single word. And Donald's friend seemed very impressed by all this, speaking at length afterwards about how cool he thought it all was. But unlike his companion, Donald wasn't happy or intrigued. In fact, he'd begun to sweat like a whore in church, and to be honest, looked like he was on the verge of tears. Donald's skin had begun to change color too, as if he were deeply embarrassed, and to make matters worse, he'd begun to grow visibly anxious. When Donald finally mustered the will to speak again, he began to downplay Chichester's voyage, saying that it was only remarkable because of his age, that any sailor with his salt could have done the same or better given similar equipment, all the while implying that the old man may have cheated a bit by using his now legendary Gypsy Moth 4, that the vessel had basically sailed itself. Donald then began to steer the conversation away from Chichester and on to plans that he himself had been making for a similar trip. Donald claimed that he'd been at it for at least four years now and felt as if he'd been preempted, his thunder stolen, his plans rendered cheap by the recent notoriety of Chichester. Well, his friend who knew him and knew he didn't have an actual boat must have rolled his eyes at this, but just the same humored him. Now, no one knows for sure whether or not Donald was telling the truth that day, or whether he had just come up with the entire story on the spot in a fit of despair and jealousy. But what we do know is that from the arrival of Francis Chichester on May 28, 1967, Donald Crowhurst changed as a human being. Where once there was doubt, 
there was now purpose. He was to go sailing around the world. Well, despite this manic episode, things stayed much as they had in the short term, with Donald's new plans and identity not yet having an outlet to express themselves. But this would all soon change. Eventually, Donald heard of a new and crazy venture put forward by the Sunday Times newspaper. They were offering a cash prize to whomsoever made the fastest solo circuit of the globe. Contestants were to leave between the months of June and October of 1968, the only catch being... None who entered were allowed to touch land until they returned to home port. For this was to be an all-water route. One solitary human versus the entire span of the globe. Well, Donald's heart leapt at this news. For whatever reason, he saw this race as the answer to all his problems. For despite having little to no experience at shipbuilding or sailing, Donald saw this as his saving grace, his last chance to be the man he had always wanted to be. He soon became fixated, obsessed even. He was going to become a famous captain, and that became his life's ambition. Everything else, friends, family, and even his wife and four children, they would all have to go by the wayside, for they would all see it was worth it in the end. All right, so he kept telling himself. Donald was now a captain without a ship, but was hell-bent on correcting this. That is without doubt the worst pirate I have ever seen. At first, Crowhurst pestered the trustees of the Gypsy Moth 4, the very vessel that Chichester had recently taken around the world. Constantly, he peppered them with letters and phone calls. In them, he told them he was a mariner of great skill and a personal admirer of Chichester. He told them that he wanted to add one last chapter to the story of an already legendary sea craft, anything he thought they might want to hear. Unsurprisingly, he never received a response. I mean, they were probably just like, Who the hell was this stalker, and why does he think we're just going to give him a boat? Well, Donald felt just a little slighted at this. Folks just weren't taking him seriously. He needed something to legitimize his venture. A signal that would lower folks' defenses and make them see Donald for the serious sailor and competitor he was. And he was serious. I mean, why couldn't anyone see that? Well, despite this, he remained confident in himself and his rising star. He would get a spot in the race, and he would win, come hell or high water. Despite not having his own boat, suitable funding, or even any relevant experience whatsoever, Donald Crowhurst had a plan. He may have not been the most skilled at sea, but few if any could match him in friendly conversation. The man was effortlessly charming and likable. It was sort of like a superpower, and it seems that's just what he used on the folks at the Sunday Times newspaper. A charm, that is. He went in and just kind of started talking to people, playing nice and forming some genuine personal connections with all the folks there. So now, at least as far as the Sunday Times newspaper was concerned, Donald Crowhurst was now a real contestant, his name now appearing in the papers besides that of real competitors, like Nigel Tetley and Robert Knox Johnston. Donald had finally made it. Collins. Fine. We'll move on. It is a fascinating world, though. And it would seem that this small bit of legitimacy was really all he needed to get the ball rolling. And I mean, unlike his electronics, the man could sell himself like no other. And I mean, he was good at it. Like, very good. His public pitches were so persuasive that even the BBC sent out a camera crew to cover this so-called mystery yachtsman. And Donald was more than happy to play the part, simply coming to life before the cameras in attention. And soon the press began to spin his story as that of a determined everyman, a working-class underdog pitted against the rich professionals, some kind of socialist Magellan bent on taking back the high seas for the common man. And Donald outwardly loved every second of it, simply coming to life before the cameras and the attention of so many. It's quite possible that if I can find uh, a bit of support in the way of sponsorship, I I, I might be in a position to build a completely new boat in time for the event. Nine captains eventually entered the Golden Globe race. Eight captains of legend, experience, and fame. And one odd man out. Our own Donald Crowhurst. A man who had sailed a few times and really liked books on exploration and tall ships. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten, y'all. And despite all the attention he was receiving, Donald was still all too aware of his actual situation. 
The fact remained, he was a sailor with no vessel, and worse still, he was broke. But much like everything else in this tale, this too would basically just fix itself, as the phone rang one day. To Donald's immediate horror, it was one of his investors, a venture capitalist by the name of Stanley Best. Well, Best explained that he'd been going over Crowhurst's books and would very much like to pull his investment from electron utilization, ending the relationship with Crowhurst and his small shop effective immediately. Well, these words simply slid off Crowhurst like water off a duck's back, for he had other plans for Mr. Best. And seriously, Donald really must have been something, like a real fast talker. Because by the time the phone call ended, Best was not only still an investor in electron utilization, but he had also guaranteed to fund Donald's boat building project. The entire thing. The millionaire investor's interest was piqued by the prospect of glory at sea, it seems. Well, whatever was said, Stanley Best had effectively agreed to sponsoring Donald's crazy dream of sailing solo around the world. The millionaire investor afterwards saying, My wife tells me I must have been mad. In the past I always invested in a sure thing, or at least a calculated risk. But now I suddenly jumped into this mammoth undertaking which I really didn't comprehend, with only the shadowiest prospect of a proper reward. But Crowhurst had a way about him, an infectious optimism that was hard to ignore. I mean, I kind of get it. You don't want to tell somebody like that, no, it's like kicking a puppy. You just kind of want to hug him and say, yeah, bud, just whatever you need. Go out and live your dream. <laughs> Don't tell him like you done before. Okay. Okay. Tell me about the rabbits, George. Now, Donald knew he was out of his depth, but also knew he was a quick study, for the man was something close to a genius. He figured he could just kind of cram a decade's worth of experience at sea into a crash course that lasted a few weeks. Meanwhile, an Essex shipyard had begun constructing a new 41-foot trimaran, Donald Crowhurst's Tinsmith Electron. The work took months for his dream boat to be finished, the work continuing on even as the first contestants began to depart for their own bids for the Golden Globe trophy. Outwardly, Crowhurst was still optimistic reminding folks that there were still two prizes up for grabs, first back and fastest overall. He explained that because he wasn't allowed to use the Gypsy Moth 4, he could have never left early enough to claim first back. But he contended that he could still claim fastest overall. He went on to explain to the press that he was custom building the fastest sailing ship to ever attempt the run, claiming that he had incorporated many of his own designs that would surely revolutionize the way these boats were assembled and sailed in the future. His vessel was to be all computerized, he said. Certain systems controlled by a primitive logic board of his own design. He assured everyone that using this, he would easily overtake all others and claim first prize. Now the problem was, none of that was actually true. The ship he was building was not, in fact, the fastest ever. Not even close, really. In fact, the men at the shipyard began to point out several basic faults in the design that rendered her slow and unstable in the water. Even though Donald raged against it, the workmen did their best to correct these flaws where and when they could. And as far as his computer was concerned, more on that later. The fact of the matter was, Donald had zero shipbuilding background, nor did he have much idea what to even bring with him on a circumnavigation of the globe. And despite all that, he had a tendency to be overambitious and meddlesome during the construction, changing his mind halfway through things and asking for useless additions at the last possible second from the exasperated workman. A dock worker who worked on the Electron had this to say when interviewed later. You couldn't really tell what was going on inside of him. He just wasn't integrated with us, if you know what I mean. He was in a daze. We'd have admired him much more if he'd simply said, I lost me nerve. Let's drop the whole business. But obviously he was in a blind panic and didn't have the guts to call it off. On September 21st, Donald got into a screaming match over the phone with the dockyard, and after hanging up, fell into a deep depression. His wife begged him that night to call it off. She just wanted her husband back, not this manic, single-minded citizen sailor. He considered her for a moment, before then saying, I suppose you're right, but the whole thing's become too important to me. I've got to go through with it, even if I have to build the boat myself on the way around. Weeks then passed, and somehow, despite his lack of knowledge and constant interference, 
The workers at Cox Marine of Essex finally finished the shell of the Tinsmith Electron. Now, this would have been good news, but Donald now had a new problem. Money. He literally had none. No money at all to kit out the vessel. No money for food. No money for water, radio, equipment, etc., etc. All of his so-called modifications and side projects had sapped whatever extra money he'd had. So cap in hand, Donald went back to Stanley Best to ask for yet more money. Well, Best was annoyed and just a bit alarmed, to be honest. But Donald did have a way about him. Assuring Best that Donald himself was all in, even showing proof that he had mortgaged his own home just to keep the venture going. Now, how a pile of unpaid utilities and a house note convinced the man is beyond me, but it, it is what it is. Best must have sighed before just handing over the money that was requested, reasoning that Donald was nothing if not sincere. It's not like he was going to run off with the money. Well, using the last of his funds, Donald kitted out the Electron as best he knew how, and on September 23rd, 1968, began preparing for what was to be a three-day run from Essex to Tinsmith. He took along a few friends for company, and together they put out, headed for a home port and final preparations. Well, the short voyage quickly became a nightmare of bad feelings and incompetence. Donald was seasick most of the time, retching over the side as his friends looked on with deep concern. This man was going to sail around the world, they must have thought. And when he wasn't puking or burning his hand on the generator, Donald was confusedly trying to steer the awkward vessel. He'd begun to grow enraged, the man railing against knots incorrectly tied and sails that just wouldn't catch the wind. Needless to say, his behavior and general lack of skill greatly alarmed his friends. And lucky for Donald, it was they who managed to wrestle the Electron back into port a full 14 days after they'd left. A far cry from the three that Donald had promised. Now, everyone including Donald was alarmed at this failure. I mean, how is this guy supposed to make a solo trip around the world when he couldn't even sail the boat from one part of England to another? But once back on land, he affected the demeanor of a veteran sailor. A man just working out the kinks. Well, to his friends, Donald chalked it all up to nerves, explaining that he'd been under a lot of stress lately and apologized as best he could. He then set to work making the hundreds of adjustments that would be needed to make the Electron seaworthy. As October came and the deadline neared, Donald's moods began to swing wildly from utter despair to the highest of heights. One minute he was boasting about his racecraft, and the next he was off in his own world on the verge of tears. At one point, the BBC crew that was filming him felt so bad for the man that they put down their cameras and picked up tools to help a manic and tearful Crowhurst finish his modifications on time. Donald's friends and family wanted to see him off, but the closer he got to leaving, the more morose and weepy he became. The day before he was set to leave, a group of friends drug him out to a tea house for some good conversation and company. But none of it was any use. Donald was simply inconsolable. A close friend later recalled that he was in a terrible state, quivering from lack of sleep and food. There was no doubt he clearly didn't want to go. He just kept murmuring, it's no good, it's no good. He knew it could kill him, but he could never quite bring himself to say so. Later that day, when alone with his wife Claire, Donald turned to her and said, almost to himself, Darling, I'm very disappointed with the boat. She's... she's not right. I'm not prepared. If I leave things in this state, will you go out of your mind with worry? Well, Claire was a little taken aback by this. But after a short pause, she responded, if you give up now, will you be unhappy for the rest of your life? But instead of an answer, the floodgates opened up, and Donald began to weep bitterly in her arms, reportedly not sleeping more than five minutes that night, just wailing and sobbing. Later, Claire had this to say about it. I was such a fool. Such a stupid fool. With all the evidence in front of me, I still didn't realize that Don was telling me that he'd failed, and he wanted me to stop him. But so persuasive and confident was Donald up to this point that she couldn't see his breakdown for what it was. She simply stood by her man and told him to follow his dreams. She didn't want to be seen by him as just another person putting him in a box. She wanted him to be happy for once in his life. But by the next morning, he was spent. 
all of his emotions poured out. And the man affected as cheerful a demeanor as he could as he finally shoved off at 5 p.m. on October 31st, 1968. It was a miserable and wet Halloween day. And not a moment too soon, mind you, as Donald had put out with a mere seven hours to spare before the final deadline. But despite the grind and the weight of all his emotions, Donald Crowhurst had somehow, some way, managed to pull it off. In a mere six months, the man had gone from a novice seaman with no boat to now a nationally renowned yachtsman who sailed with the hopes of an entire nation at his back. Well, all that was left to him now was to live up to the high expectations everyone had for him to become the man he always wanted to be. Donald knew what a close run thing all of this had been, even failing to launch the first time that day around 3 p.m. due to his sails being improperly rigged. Everything was rushed. But all that was behind him now. He would have plenty of time in the coming months to get it right. <laughs> Well, I shouldn't have labeled those in pencil, should I? He would just have to learn on the job, he thought. Donald spent the next few days attempting to install certain innovations of his own design. He felt like now was the perfect opportunity, since there'd been no time at Harvard. And, everything. Look at and foremost of all his designs was his primitive computer. This control board was supposed to automate parts of the ship, and he was desperate to get it up and running. But, unfortunately, he could never get the thing quite working. An article in Yachting World magazine later calling his device no more than a bunch of wires. Whoa! Look at all the wires in there. You don't want all those wires too? Yeah, of course. I wouldn't have taken it off if I didn't. Now this wasn't necessarily his fault. It's not like he faked making a computer or anything. No, in his rush to leave, he had left several big crates full of supplies on the dock. And unfortunately, some of those boxes had vital gear inside, like extra pipe and most of his computer's components. It seems as though the man had overpacked and left himself no time at all to stow it. So when the time came, he had to leave a bunch of stuff behind. And that's how most of his preparations went. Everything was done in a hurry and at the last minute, and things were overlooked. So many things. And it seems that most of his early voyage went that way. Donald would try something out, only to find that he was either too unskilled or hadn't packed the correct gear to pull it off. Well, as the days passed, Donald found life at sea far more taxing than anything he ever could have imagined. Everything just kept breaking. Ropes would knot and stick in the rigging. His radio kept blowing fuses, and worse yet, his self-steering gear broke on him. Now, this might not sound like a big deal, but this meant that he would have to be up on deck steering at all times. It also meant that if he wanted to sleep, he'd be forced to drop anchor or otherwise be blown wherever the wind decided to take him. But apart from these relatively minor issues came one major one. Mere days into his lone sojourn and still just off the coast of France, his vessel sprung a major leak. Well, Donald was just minding his own business when he noticed that part of his boat was sitting low in the water. Well, running over to investigate, he opened the hatch and his heart sank. It was full of water. And so, for the next few hours, he tried to play with various pieces of pipes like Lego pieces, trying like his life depended on it to rig some sort of siphon for his bilge pump. But he had little success. All the pieces for this task were again sitting in crates back on the dock at Tinsmith. No, instead, he was forced to go at it with a bucket, bailing and bailing. Now this worked, but the effort absolutely thrashed his body. Donald had never worked so hard in his life. He later wrote in his diary, Hell of a morning for me, though. I was feeling pleased with myself when I noticed that bubbles were blowing out from below the right forward hatch. All evidence was that this compartment was full of water. <sighs> I cursed the people that had been kind enough to help me stow the ship, and I cursed myself for a fool. I swore the boat was a toy only fit for the broads or the pools at Earl's Court. And only about a week after that ordeal, another more serious leak occurred. And again, he was forced to bail and bail and bail for his life. And unfortunately for him, this leak also hosed down his generator, leaving little crystalline salt deposits all over the vital machine. And this meant that even after he got the boat dry, he would be forced to take the generator apart and painstakingly clean every contact and scrub every surface before she would run again. <laughs> 
This also meant that in the meantime, he would be left in the dark, his vessel just a white smudge on an endless ocean. By November 15th, 1968, Donald had made it as far as Portugal, which kind of filled him with further dread and apprehension. He knew full well that the great Francis Chichester had made that same run in a mere six days, as opposed to his now fifteen. He was behind, way behind. In his despair, Donald began to throw tantrums and rage against himself and everyone around him, trying as best he could to shift blame. Yes, you're acting weird, man. Are you okay? Around this time, he wrote in his diary, This bloody boat is just falling to pieces due to lack of attention to engineering detail. Later that same day, though, Donald unpacked the camera that the BBC had given him for the trip and began recording a very different message. In it, he told the world how much fun he was having and how all the hardships were just a matter of course for a stalwart sailor of his caliber. But even in this early recording, cracks in his psyche could already be seen. At one point, he explains to the camera that, of course, single-handing it has its compensations. No matter how schizophrenic you are, it's difficult to fall out with a the crew. They're excellent people from captain to cabin boy. Months earlier, Donald had boasted that he was building the fastest boat to ever attempt the run, claiming that his vessel would average 220 miles in a day. But now, floating out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, hands cut to the bone and skin covered in fluid-filled boils, the weight of all he had promised began to crash down upon him. He must have just kept asking himself over and over, how am I going to make this right? How can I salvage something, just, just I anything from the self-imposed nightmare? Five weeks had now passed. Five weeks of agony and regret. Donald knew he would have to round Africa at some point, and he began to ready himself for the trip. He took stock of his boat and his abilities, and then blanched. He knew that if he continued south toward the Cape of Good Hope, that his vessel would break apart. For the place had another name. The Cape of Storms. For that region lay in what sailors call the Roaring Forties, a powerful band of wind running west to east across the entire globe. Now the problem was, these waters were a graveyard, her sea bottom seeing countless wrecks of ships both big and small. The violence of this place gave rise to the very legend of the Flying Dutchman once upon a time. Not a place to be taken lightly, and it would take much skill to tame those winds and currents, Skills Donald knew he didn't possess. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. Donald poured over his charts and tried to make sense of them, confiding to his diaries his many worries and the few options left to him. He knew he couldn't turn back, not this early, for to return now would be a humiliation, one that would ruin him financially as well as socially. <sighs> he could see it now, the headlines reading, Terrible Sailor Calls It Quits, or Every Man Skipper Says Wind's Too Strong. Oh god, he couldn't bear it. This venture was supposed to solve all of his problems. He was supposed to return in triumph as much to vindicate the work of everyone who had helped him get here, as well as to help himself. He he just had to make this work. He he had to find some way. He just he he, he just had to. Around this time he wrote in his diary. Racked by the growing awareness that I must soon decide whether or not to go on in the face of the actual situation. <sighs> what a bloody awful decision to chalk it in at this stage. What a bloody awful decision. If I stop or disappoint a lot of people. Stanley Best, most important. Then fringe people. Rodney Halway. The folks at Tinsmith who supported the scheme. <sighs> He goes on to speculate that if he could only just get funding for another try next year. <sighs> he was obviously desperate and grasping for anything and everything he could think of to save face. But deep down, he knew full well that this was it. There would be no second chances for a man like him. But how was he to save face? How was he to get around the Roaring Forties? Well, it was right about then that he remembered his sea charts. They did have a lot of information in them. In fact... Most of what he needed. Cautiously at first, he went for his logs, moving as if he were being watched by some outside force. He opened them up and began thumbing through charts, 
stopping on one showing the paths of major cargo ships in the area. Slowly at first, and then more confidently, he traced his fingers in a slow, wide arc over empty seas, and a plan began to take shape in his head. If I could just stay invisible. Donald Crowhurst's time as a legitimate competitor lasted a mere month and a half. In that time, he had barely made it past the Iberian Peninsula and nearly died several times over for his trouble. It's not like he wasn't trying. The novice seaman had indeed picked up many tricks, now handling his rickety boat with something approximating skill, but still, it was no use. Neither he nor his vessel had it in them to breach the Roaring Forties let alone make it all the way around the world and around South America again. Even worse waters. Go on, signore, laugh. Laugh! Show my mediocrity for all to see. One day I will laugh at you. No. In order to protect himself and the people he loved, Donald Crowhurst decided to cheat. Why go around the world at all, he thought. Why not hide in plain sight and wait it out? I mean, for real, it's not like anyone was checking up on him. It could work. You want to know why? Cause I'm a liar! Well, Donald again began to trace a figure-eight pattern off the coast of South America, the top portion stretching from the easternmost tip of Brazil, the bottom all the way down to the southern coast of Argentina. He was certain that if he followed that course, no ship or living soul could spot him. For his meticulous research had showed him that there were still wide swaths of the Atlantic where one could hide, one could go years in those seas without seeing another living soul, he must have thought. He knew it would be a whole lot of waiting, almost like being in a prison cell, but it was a price he was willing to pay. He kind of deserved it, he thought. And besides, he couldn't return too soon. As no one would ever believe that he had made it all the way around the world in a mere three months. No, he would need to drift until at least April, or better yet, May of 1969. At least seven months of doing absolutely nothing but making big circles in an empty ocean. Well, day and night, Donald sat listening to far-off radio broadcasts, jotting down information as if intercepting enemy transmissions during a war. And it was like a war, or better yet, like a siege. For you see, Donald needed information, and lots of it. For he had resolved to recreate all the data that he would have gained while circling the globe. And to do this... He needed daily weather, direction of tides and currents, wind, and any other local information that might give his fake log some added realism and flavor. He wasn't about to be left flat-footed. If he was to be a fraud, then he would be the most thorough and calculating in history. But the strain obviously was getting to him. I imagine the man waking up in the middle of the night terrified of what he might have left out. Thinking, what if the skies near Australia were obscured by dust and the radio man failed to mention it? What if he had reported a storm off the African coast, only for other ships to claim it was the fairest weather they'd ever seen? Oh god, what if, what if, what if? Well, one day, the winds began to pick up at his back, and he found his Tinsmith Electron was actually making excellent time. Well, this gave him an idea. That day, Donald's friendly wind legitimately blew him some 160 miles far short of his boasted 220 average, but still. Nice. A personal best and a real-life triumph for the novice seaman. Even still, though, this wouldn't impress anyone back home. Such numbers were to be expected from someone like him. My uncle once told me that the strongest high schooler in the world goes here. No, he needed to think bigger. He needed to calculate how far such a wind would have taken a seasoned professional. Well, he decided that it probably would have been a world record. So instead of the truth, he recorded himself going an astounding 243 miles in 24 hours. A number more fitting to his image as a skilled navigator and peerless shipwright. After that, Donald quickly got on the radio and gave his account of the record-breaking run, telling folks back home about his miracle mile and how close a run thing it had been. The funny thing is, he didn't have to lie. It had been a close-run thing, and he had triumphed. Problem was, he exaggerated the outcome. And as you might imagine, the folks back home took this news with astonishment. This Joe Everyman had just broken the world record. Their hometown hero was now the fastest man to ever sail. 
The press began to run the story, and soon Donald's radio was abuzz with tearful congratulations and promises of rewarding opportunities when he got home. They were all just so proud of him. Well, now that he had captured his own sliver of glory, all he had to do was play the waiting game. Donald knew that he would have to choose his moment of triumphant return carefully. And in a perfect world, he would wait for at least one other man to claim both first back and fastest overall, before then slinking back to England to claim his little slice of notoriety. Donald knew he couldn't attempt to actually win the race, that to do so would put all of his accomplishments and his fake logs under much undue scrutiny. And if that happened, he wasn't sure how any of it would hold up, or himself for that matter. He kept asking himself, was he really ready to live the rest of his life with a lie like that hanging over his head? <sighs> Either way, he told himself it wouldn't matter. That really, who was going to look into the logs of a man who came in third? No, the best thing he could do was keep his cool and wait it all out. Stiff up a lip and all that. As Aristotle once wrote, He who is unable to live in society, or who has no need because he is sufficient for himself, must either be a beast or a god. Isolation is a strange thing. Some crave it, while others fall completely to pieces. But all we really know for certain is that it's super bad for you. Humans simply need each other to stay rational and sane. Physicians have shown a strong correlation in prison populations between pre-existing mental illness and adverse side effects from even short stints of isolation. Now, Donald wasn't a prisoner per se, but in his situation he may as well have been. For not only was he geographically isolated, but he was also socially and emotionally isolated. His true feelings left bottled up lest they reveal his deceptions. Sometime around Christmas 1968, Donald spoke to his wife via radio phone. In the call, she told him how proud everyone was of him and how much she and the children loved him. As he listened to his wife's voice, Donald allowed himself to drift away for a minute. But then she asked where he was. He hadn't reported his exact coordinates for a few days now, and she would very much like to keep their friends and children up to date. Well, Donald quickly dodged the question, lest he make a mistake in the heat of the moment. He needed to have the logs in front of him before he would just answer any question like that. Ugh. There was no room in this game for weakness or lapses of judgment. One slip of the tongue could ruin everything. He would need to be perfect to pull this off. When he did answer, Donald simply told her that he hadn't had time to do a sighting in a while. Now, he hated lying to the love of his life, but it was all for the best. She would see that. He just kept telling himself this was all for them anyway. That all these little white lies he told were in the service to a greater good and a better life for all of them. But Donald knew the truth. And to be honest, I'm sure it got to the point where his heart sank every time the radio chimed in. All their loving remarks and words of encouragement did was remind him of how much of a failure he really was. Reminded him of how undeserving he was of any of it. In order to take his mind off the eighth circle of hell that he had placed himself in, he began to read books on Einstein's relativity over and over. He became fascinated by the concept of elemental particles, weaving this into his understanding of God and reality itself. And it was in this pressure cooker of shame and cosmic exploration that he began to write. Now some of what he wrote amounted to sound observations on the nature of life, and some pretty decent insights from a man who had definitely seen a few things. But large portions of it delved into the abstract and, dare I say, nonsensical. Around this time, he wrote, My footstool's a ten-pound cask of rice. To the northeast, 2.5 times ten cubed miles. 250 times ten cubed babies would slowly die, too weak to fuss. By the time Christmas Day of 1968 had arrived, he had allowed grief to cloud his judgment. Donald had gotten it into his head that he would simply die if he didn't see another human being. He didn't need to speak to them, or even so much as interact, but a shape? A form on the horizon? He just needed to feel that there was another soul in the world, that the voices coming from his radio weren't just figments of his imagination conjured by his own madness, that he wasn't in hell. But just as the coast of Brazil came into view over the horizon, Donald snapped out of it. <coughs> he pulled away from the coast as quickly as he could, hoping beyond hope that no other ship or land-based radio hailed him. 
That was the last thing he needed. After a few days of tense sailing, Donald again found himself back on empty seas. Just where he wanted to be. And in order to keep it that way, Donald resolved to go radio silent. He couldn't afford to be tracked. I mean, no telling what could happen. I mean, what if he reported his false location, only for the locals to ask that he make contact? Then what? He might even end up a fugitive for running from some navy he was nowhere near. <sighs> Anything could happen. Also, he wanted to discourage any more calls from home. No telling what another conversation with them would do to his fragile state of mind. And so, Donald put out a few last messages, each more garbled than the one before it. He told them he was having generator trouble again, and it might be a while before he would be able to make contact. Then, Donald Crowhurst disappeared to the outside world. The man now a ghost floating in empty seas. The next few months were a monotonous blur, each day blending into the next and the one before it, the horizon never changing, and the sun never ceasing to cast its glare. Donald was floating in a vast desert, one made completely of undrinkable and deadly salt water. But slowly but surely he made his way around it, following his figure-eight course. Never once did he see another living soul, and never once did he allow himself use of the radio. He had to disappear. He had to make himself unreal, a living ghost. And yet, all he really wanted in the entire world was to hear his children's voices, to wrap his arms around his wife and apologize for all that he had done, to take it all back, to wake up and for everything to just be normal. But he knew that in order for any of that to happen, he would have to complete his sufferings that his sentence on the high seas was not yet finished, and for him, there would be no parole. By February, Donald was now in dire straits, and in more ways than one. His body was now a charred mass of peeling skin and deflated boils that caught on just about everything he brushed against, tearing skin away from him in sheets. <laughs> What's going on? What's all this flaky stuff sticking to my fingers? Simply check. It's dead skin. And I'm not even kidding, the man was all torn up, bleeding in so many places that he began to take antibiotics on a regular basis in order to combat any possible infection. The man was simply a wreck. And Donald's Tinsmith Electron hadn't fared much better than he had. Her hull was now cracked in several places, and her hardware and rigging were way worse for wear. Even Donald knew she couldn't hold up much longer, that he would have to land in order to make some repairs. But where? He knew if he touched land and word got out, well, that would be it. His fraud would ping from one end of the globe before he could even get back on the boat. I mean, not only was touching land an automatic fail, but he was supposed to be somewhere off the coast of India or something right now. How could he explain just showing up in Argentina? Well, there is one thing. Yeah? Why were you in the broom closet? Because I'm a warrior. Just more crap for Donald to stress about, he thought. But he was used to it by now, and quickly pulled out his trusty sea charts, for he had another idea. By March 9th, 1969, he was ready, and decided to make a secret stop at an estuary of the Rio Salado in Argentina. He chose the spot based on a lack of infrastructure in the area connecting it to the rest of the nation, as maps showed no rail lines or major roads anywhere near where he was going. As he crept closer to land, he began to scan the coast with binoculars. To his great relief, he saw no telephone poles or giant antennas anywhere he looked. That meant no radios, either. Excellent. With much excitement, Donald made landfall like some kind of half-mad conquistador, boldly going ashore and chatting up the confused locals like a man possessed. Well, most of the folks couldn't understand this crazy sunburnt Brit, but thought he looked kind of off. For the man before them had a wild look about him, beard unkempt, bearing uneasy, and his eyes were glazed and bloodshot. But most of them simply remembered his creepy smile and constant laughter, which kind of unnerved everyone just a bit. They weren't sure if he was just a nutcase, or a drug runner, or what. When he was asked what he wanted, Donald told them that he needed some plywood and nails in order to win some sort of race. <laughs> 
The townsfolk were just like, okay, sure, bud, whatever. They didn't have what he needed, but knew of a man that did. And soon Donald was driven inland to the home of a French expat who lived nearby. Now the Frenchman whined and died in the mad sailor, asking him all sorts of questions, but this seems to have been merely a formality, for Donald wasn't making much sense to these people. The Frenchman later remembered him as kind of a weirdo, one witness later saying, He laughed too much. It was as if he was making fun of us. But awkward table manners or no, Donald was eventually given everything he asked for. So at least it would appear that, communication barrier or not, Donald's charm still shone through. Well, after finishing its repairs, Donald said his goodbye to the people of Argentina and set out back into his figure eight of isolation, leaving the folks on shore just as ignorant as when he arrived. Who was that guy? Well, this contact with humans must have reminded him of everything he'd been missing, for the cavity in his heart had now become too big to staunch with mere band-aids and books on atomic physics. He just wanted to go home. Just wanted to hug his kids. He just, he just wanted to go to sleep and forget any of this ever happened. Now, Donald had planned to stay hidden for at least a few more weeks. At least May, but he just, he just couldn't anymore. Just as the call from Claire had sent him into a spiral of self-destructive behavior, so too did this contact with the good people of the Rio Salardo. He told himself that he had waited long enough, that he just needed a change. He, he just he needed to know it was all over. He just he needed to go home. Donald must have looked at his radio with a mix of apprehension and joy. For months he had been desperate to use the thing, desperate to speak to another human being who liked him. But now he hesitated. He knew that as soon as he picked up the handset that there would be no going back, and his lie would become real again, that he would transition from the liminal to the actual. Finally, inevitably, he picked up the handset and sent out to the world the immortal call sign, Heading Digger Ramirez, alluding to Diego Ramirez, a small island just south of the tip of South America. Well, this news hit the world like a lightning bolt, sending shockwaves through the press. If what Donald was saying was true, then then he was on track to take the fastest overall time comfortably. I mean, people absolutely lost their minds, hailing Crowhurst and his miracle boat as living legends. For it would seem that all of his tinkering and modifications had been successful after all, that this hometown inventor had outbuilt the finest shipwrights in the nation. But funny enough, it was Francis Chichester himself that began to voice private doubts almost immediately. <laughs> a picture may be worth a thousand words, but a single real action is worth more. Questioning how Crowhurst could have possibly averaged such a fast time as he claimed. The older man knew sailing ships far too well to be fooled by these numbers, and instinctively he smelled a rat. On April 22, 1969, the first contestant made it back home. And no surprises, it was the legendary Robert Knox Johnston. But though he was showered with praise in interviews, his welcome was tempered by the knowledge that there were still three men out there racing for the fastest overall time, the more prestigious of the two prizes. And even Knox himself had to admit he'd been slow. Around this same time, another man by the name of Bernard Mortossier had nearly finished with the race. When all of a sudden he decided that one solo trip around the world was not enough, he would make it too. But to leave it there would be to do Mr. Motossier great injustice, so I'll give the last word on the subject to him. He explained, quote, My intention is to continue the voyage, still non-stop towards the Pacific Islands. There, there is plenty of sun and much more peace than in Europe. Please do not think I am trying to break a record. Record is a very stupid word at sea. I am continuing on non-stop because I am happy at sea, and perhaps because I want to save my soul. He would go on for several more months, eventually going over 37,000 miles before he finally made landfall. <laughs> 
is just another epic episode in the drama that was the Sunday Times race of 1968 through 69. And after that whole thing, that only left two competitors. Our own Donald Crowhurst, and one Nigel Tetley. And up until Donald's bold heading digger Ramirez, Tetley had thought himself a shoe-in for the fastest overall time. After all, it was Nigel Tetley himself who had practically invented the idea of soloing in a trimaran. But after the call went out, Tetley began to crunch numbers and found that if Crowhurst finished within even a month, he would easily win the fastest overall time, setting a new record and winning all the fame and glory away from Nigel himself. Okay, that's what I didn't want to have happen. Um... This was simply intolerable. So with Crowhurst apparently hot on his heels for the prize, Tetley began to take risks, pushing his own 40-foot trimaran Victress to its absolute limits. All right. Ship's outer skin is beginning to heat, Captain. Orbit plot shows we have about eight minutes left. Scotty, I can't change the laws of physics. If he could just bump up his average a few more miles a day, then maybe he'd still have a shot, he must have thought. But as far as Crowhurst was concerned, Tetley needn't have worried. Crowhurst had no interest in winning first place. That would bring far too much attention, way too much scrutiny. No, he would love to settle for second, or better yet, third. He really just wanted to get credit for his supposed 243 miles in 24 hours. With that record, he could salvage his reputation and possibly his fortunes without anyone looking too closely at him or his logs. For almost a month after, Tetley tirelessly pushed his boat, sailing in friendly winds and brutal gales alike. It didn't matter. And what was better was, he had been monitoring Crowhurst's progress like a hawk since the announcement and found that the commoner had slowed way down. His average time was now going in the sink. Lucky for him, the upstart had announced some minor troubles with his new boat. <laughs> this was great news indeed, thought Tetley. If he could only keep up his current pace for a few more days, then Crowhurst wouldn't have a chance in hell of beating him. So with that in mind, Tetley just kept pushing. Nigel began to take risks he never would have in the past, and this right at the moment his vessel was at its weakest. And he could see it plain as day. Each time his ship went down on a new wave, new cracks would form on her skin. And the pumps had been running a whole lot lately. Still, he had to keep it up. She would hold out long enough for him to defeat the amateur nipping at his heels. This was his race. But reality finally hit Tetley on May 30th of 1969, when his boat began to break up into several pieces right beneath him. Well, in despair and no doubt cursing Donald's name, Tetley was forced to abandon the victress and his dreams of first prize. Now Tetley was out, driven to destruction by Crowhurst's lies. And now... All that Donald feared had come to pass. All eyes were now on him. Like it or not, he was now a national hero, the focus of everyone's attention. And it was literally everything he'd ever wanted. Everyone loved him, and more than that, everyone was now taking him seriously. Only he hated every second of it. This isn't how any of this was supposed to happen. A classic example of be careful what you wish for, for you just might get it. For he had already made peace with his old life. He was happy to go back to it. But now, the one he had always wanted was placed before him. A cruel glimpse of who he could have been had things been different. And continuously his radio crackled with congratulations and loving encouragement. Each burst another dagger in his heart. Donald just wanted a pat on the back and for everyone to forget. Once he settled on his fraud, he was never looking for fame. He didn't deserve it. He didn't even want it anymore. He just wanted it all to be over, to wake up next to his wife and go back to peddling transistors from his little hole in the wall. But he knew he couldn't. He knew nothing would ever be the same again for him. Now Donald had already taken to drinking heavily during his figure eight of isolation, one of the few coping mechanisms left to him. Hell, he even recorded himself drunk multiple times with the BBC equipment, grinning and laughing at the camera like a 14-year-old who was getting away with something. But. Now this was different. In the days since Tetley sank, his personality began to rapidly change, his grasp on reality failing. Donald retreated to his diary and his logs, and there he began to write on the nature of existence, musing on how a man might free himself from this life, merging his consciousness with that of reality itself, gaining an understanding of his God of creation. <laughs> 
and it just continued on like that. The closer he drifted to England, the more messianic his writings became, soon explaining that he had cracked the nature of existence, and that when his writings were studied by those back home, that they would change the human experience as they knew it. Quote, And this is how I solve the problem, and how I let you inside my soul, which is now at peace. I give you my book. I am lucky. I've done something interesting at last. At last, my system has noticed me. And it would appear that by the 23rd, he had come up with a new plan. A way to salvage something tangible from the mess he had created for himself. For on June 23rd, 1969, he made a strange recording on the last blank tape he had. Quote, The poison's in your body. You must get rid of them. I don't know what they are, but they've got to go. The sea's the way to be rid of them, I'm sure. I feel them in tremendous shape. I've never felt so. And that's where the reel ends. Another one of his lies cut short by cruel reality. And the coming days were no kinder to Crowhurst than the past few had been. Tormented by madness and grief, he began to pour out his thoughts onto paper, desperate to make sense of the swirling thoughts that tore through his mind like a hurricane. Day and night he began to write, swinging from fair points on the nature of life to off-the-wall nonsensical things, literal ravings. It would almost be funny if I hadn't become so familiar with his writing style while he was in better health. It's a truly brutal thing to watch someone deteriorate in real time. To see a writing style so clear and legible be reduced to a muddled rambling. All I can say is that he must have been in serious mental agony. Utter inner desolation. Around 10 a.m. on the 1st of June, Donald Crowhurst woke up and began writing what was to be his final letter. 10, 23, 40 seconds. Cannot see any purpose in game. 10, 25, 10 seconds. Must resign position in sense that have set myself impossible task, then nothing achieved by game. 10, 29, 0 seconds. And now is revealed the true nature and purpose and power of the game offense. I am what I am, and I see the nature of my offense. I will only resign this game if you agree that on the next occasion that this game is played, it will be played according to the rules that are devised by my great God, who has revealed at last to his son not only the exact nature and reasons for games, but has also revealed the truth of the way of the ending of the next game, that it is finished. It is finished. It is mercy. Eleven, fifteen, zero seconds. It is the end of my... my game. The truth has been revealed, and it will be done as my family requires me to do it. Eleven, seventeen, zero seconds. It is the time for your move to begin. I have not need to prolong the game. It has been a good game that must be ended at... The words are missing. I will play this game when I choose. I will resign the game. 11, 20, 40 seconds. 11, 20, 40 seconds. There is no reason for harmful... The sentence is incomplete. The note ends abruptly. Donald Crowhurst not even bothering to finish the L in harmful. It's thought that after that he walked away from his pen in a daze, stumbling over to the edge of his tinsmith electron. And there he stood for maybe a second, maybe even for hours. But eventually he decided to put his final plan into motion. He could offer no greater apology, no greater pledge of his sincerity than his own life, or so he must have convinced himself. For at some point on that day he threw himself to the waves, Allowing his dream boat to drift on without her cat, Donald Crowhurst had ended the game, a victim of brutal isolation and unresolved self-loathing. He was only 37 years old. Tinsmith agog at your wonders. Whole town planning a huge welcome. 
was simply one among dozens of glowing transmissions sent Donald's way by the overjoyed residents of Tinsmith. Everyone was simply ecstatic that one of their own could best the greatest sailors and engineers on the planet. But this joy and atmosphere of sudden notoriety was to be short-lived. For something seemed to have happened. Though they were clamoring for news, Donald had stopped responding. No bother, they must have thought. He had gone silent the whole of the Pacific leg. More generator troubles, to be sure. The damn thing had never quite worked right. He'd turn up. After all, the man was a hero. Well, depending on if Crowhurst's logs were accurate or not, the mail ship RMV Picardy found the electron either nine or ten days after Crowhurst's last log entry. Sailors from the Picardy went aboard the ghost ship and confirmed that the radio was in working order and there was no damage from high waves present. None of them could honestly say how she'd come to lose her captain. That is, until the notes were found. Well, the news hit Tinsmith and the wider world like a broken gas main. Everyone just wanted to know what the hell just happened. How could their hometown hero be dead? And this close to home? And meanwhile, with Tetley sunk and Matassier off saving his soul, the legendary Robert Knox Johnston was now eligible for both prizes, decisively winning the Golden Globe Trophy. And in an act of chivalry, Knox Johnston donated all of his winnings to Crowhurst's widow Claire. For to the man's horror, he learned that Donald had left his wife and his children in wretched poverty, mortgaging the family home several times over in order to build his electron and go out and live his dream on the high seas. Meanwhile, the Crowhurst family had been living in a house with no heat, Claire working as best she could to just barely keep her home, even as the bills piled up around her like prison walls. Later, Crowhurst's son Simon was quoted as saying, I have total admiration and huge respect for Sir Robin. Not to retract his gift once it became clear that my father had done such a terrible thing, had not sailed around the world and was actually disqualified much earlier by going ashore in South America. It showed a great capacity for empathy. In another life years later, on the set of Deep Water in 2008, Knox Johnston was asked about the donation. The man simply replied, I'd never expected to win that money, so it just made sense. His donation helped to pay off the Crowhurst's mortgage, as well as allowed them to keep their home, and more importantly, their dignity, especially during what was to follow. As scholars and sailors began to sift through the piles of logs and philosophical writings left aboard the Electron, evidence of a calculated fraud began to take shape. Investigators found multiple logs and charts, some saying where he actually was, and others forged to look like where he wanted to appear to be. Donald had been shockingly thorough, some experts even saying that he could have fooled the world had he chose to do so. His fake charts were nearly flawless down to the temperature, weather, shipping, and possible land sightings. Just perfect. Investigators were mesmerized by the scope and audacity of the fraud. The sheer skill and effort on display was overwhelming. As the investigation deepened, they quickly learned that the Electron had been the lair of a mad genius, a man of formidable intellect and mental fortitude. But despite the logs and reams of BBC tape speaking of his false accomplishments, they also found other writings, rambling documents full of self-loathing and fear. His was a mind already on edge, and months of isolation and much-deserved guilt finally broke him. But he didn't break all at once. In my opinion, it was his pushing of Tetley that finally broke his mind. When he declared heading Digger Ramirez and put himself well ahead of his competitors, this caused Tetley to push his own vessel harder than she could bear, thus causing his eventual sinking. And any personal responsibility aside, the man could have died, spurred on by a lie. Crowhurst hadn't even returned home yet, and already somebody had almost died because of him. I guarantee you Donald felt this deep in his heart, probably wondering how many more people his lies would hurt going forward, probably asking if it was even worth it. And now with Tetley gone, Crowhurst was the object of everyone's attention, and the fear began to bubble until it overflowed. Ironically, his logs were near perfect, as I said, and had he had more self-esteem or less moral fiber, he could have and probably would have fooled the world, at least for a while. <laughs> 
maybe even forever. But that was one potential humiliation too far, and he simply couldn't bear it. Donald always wanted to be legitimate, and because of his lie, knew that he never could now. And at the end, I'm sure he realized that he had no one else to blame. Not anymore. For this time, he had placed himself in the box. The Crowhurst family did their best to put their lives back together, but never quite got away from the exploits of their eccentric patriarch. Even at age 85, Claire was receiving knocks at her door, intermittently enduring the peppering of reporters and the generally curious alike, all people wanting a glimpse of Donald's ghost through her fading recollections. In the decades since Donald took his own life, the story's been told over and over again. Some portray Crowhurst as the mad sailor dancing on the gunnels as his life implodes around him, while others have seen him as a socialist superhero, a gentle philosopher crushed by the capitalists and the wider society they had created. But for my part, I see him as an extremely talented and motivated individual, but one with extreme tunnel vision. I see a midlife crisis, a last-ditch lunge for the life he always wished for. I see a man crushed by guilt in his moments of clarity, but also one who would continue on in spite of himself. But even that assessment is simply a caricature of the man who really was. A mere straw puppet. I'll give the last word on that subject to Simon Crowhurst, who had this to say when interviewed about 2017's The Mercy, a movie about his father starring Colin Firth. I think there's a kind of coherence to it, but most of that relates to how he sees his situation at the end of his voyage. His guilt, a lot of it is, by implication, his sense of guilt. And the sins. The sins of concealment, of not being where you're supposed to be. Hiding, which is what he's done. I feel sorry for him. He's actually somewhere on the margins of philosophy and madness, you know, sailing over the edge of the world. The Guardian article goes on to point out, quote, One disturbing thing about the new film is that Simon worries that his own memories are being overwritten. Simon goes on to say, You wonder which is true, the memory or the reconstruction. And I mean, that's really the heart of any retelling of events. As we age and as others add their two cents, the narrative of events changes, and along with them are perceptions of the people involved. For individuals, it's called neuroplasticity, the concept that one's memories become malleable again when we're called. And that's kind of what Simon was getting at. Many essays, books, and documentaries were made about his father, all with their own take on Donald's life, and each taking just a bit of creative license. And since Simon was fairly young, he had had far more time to look at the straw men and wax caricatures that others had created for him than he had ever had with his real father. And so he mused, you wonder which is true, the memory or the reconstruction. And well, the answer is, you'll never truly know. Even with the reams of paperwork and recording Donald left us, no one can definitely say why he did any of it. And like so much in history, we can know the who, what, where, when, and how of things, but our understanding often fails us at the why, for that alone belongs to the people involved. Mm -hmm.